Yeah, so hi, everybody. I'm Alex. I'm a senior developer at Outlier. I'm going to talk about how we built our Docker monitoring solution. So basically, as Tony mentioned, as he showed you a screenshot, we are a monitoring solution. So we provide you with an agent, and you run that agent either via Docker or via Python, uh, as a Python process. It collects metrics, and it flows into our backend. Then you can get dashboards and so on and alerts based on those metrics. Um, there's also a couple of us here, as Tony said. So there's like um, two of us there, um, and also me. So if you have any questions, or if you're a user and you've got complaints, you know, we're here for that, uh, for any questions or, uh, or screams. Um, and for the talk, before I get into the details, I'm going to assume that everybody, of course, knows what Docker is, and they also are familiar uh, with the user perspective of Docker. So you know, how do I run containers? Uh, how do I check logs for any container? Uh, you know, how do I build images and so on and so forth? Um, and before I actually also get into even more technical details, there are some facts here about Docker that we got from our customer database. Um, so we found that 12% of the hosts that we monitor, so the ones that we run, uh, or that our customers run the agent on, uh, run Docker, um, so they run containers. And this has gone up from about 0% eight, uh, 18 months ago, so it's going quite rapidly. And we found that every new customer also asks us about Docker monitoring, so it's clearly, uh, it's clearly a thing that's in the, in the industry now. Um, we also found that the average host runs eight containers, so this translates to you having eight, time, eight times more metrics per host. So previously, of course, if you had you know, like CPU percentage and uh, memory percentage, um, per host. Now you need to get those metrics as well per container. So if you know if on average your host runs the containers, you get on average eight times more metrics, right? We also found that the average container runs for two days. Um, so of course, you know we found um, if we had a customer that uh, their average container uh, ran for six minutes. So obviously they have some batch jobs running. So when they get the containers down, they bring them back up, and even though the build or, or the image is exactly the same, the, the IDs will be regenerated. So for us, that's a bit of an issue. Because obviously, you know, if you think about it, you have like container ID dot CPU usage. Um, even though everything is the same, there'll be a new ID the next time. And for us, uh, for database, it's quite a big load. As we need to keep all those indexes in, um, you know, in our database. So in terms of the basics to monitor Docker, you know, it kind of changes the fundamentals of how we do things. As on a host, you know, everything is kind of like accessible to you uh, as an agent. All the processes are local. There are no real kind of um, boundaries or borders to accessing those processes, uh, except of course permissions issues. But on Docker, you've got everything isolated in containers, right? So it's a bit of a different paradigm, um, and there's a bit more of a difficulty to getting data from those processes. So our solution was originally built for uh, virtual machines and host monitoring, but yeah, we kind of had to adapt to it, um, to uh, Docker monitoring. And of course, like something that you guys might say is, oh, you know, you can just put a, an agent on, on each of those containers, right? And yeah, you could do that, but you really shouldn't, um, as it wouldn't be really a, a good idea, I'll say. Uh, so yeah, just to recap what I have um, I just said, you know, in the VM environments, all the processes are accessible from the local hosts. Uh, your agent or your monitoring agent that collects the metrics is going to run on each VM, and then you've got plugins that can monitor each process. So if you've got Postgres, you will have like a Postgres plugin that's basically going to connect to Postgres and get some metrics, like the number of locks on your database, and so on and so forth. And so forth. On container monitoring or in the container monitoring world, you know, all the processes are then siloed into containers, so you can't as easily access them. And usually, you deploy the host either on its own container for ease of deployment, of course, or on the host VM, so outside of kind of the, the level of Docker. And you can't really monitor inside the, the container, so you kind of have to go in from the outside and then run those processes to the inside. So, as I said, you know, you might have Postgres or some other database, and what this means is that you kind of need to do like a Docker exec, let's say, if you're running like like Redis, uh, say if, you're, if your plugin will do Redis CLI. Then use the numbers that the, that command uh, gives you to, uh, you know, for you to um, basically graph on a dashboard. You can just run Redis CLI, right? Because that will go to localhost by default. Um, so you kind of need to do a Docker exactly if you don't want it to, to, of course, point to your container and change the listing address. And in the same way, if you've got, uh, you know, like a database like Mongo, uh, and you don't want to change the listing addresses, you need to inject the container IP address on your plugin so that it knows um, how to basically connect to, to your Mongo. This also is made a bit more difficult by the fact that now we've got orchestration, right? So we've got Kubernetes, Mesosphere, Swarm. Um, and orchestration in general makes things more complex as it's kind of like a higher level to Docker. And it makes the environment something like that. Um, you can kind of see that. Um, so what, and what that image kind of is trying to portray is that you have no guarantees, right, to where a container is running. Like part of the point of you running an orchestration system is that you're going to have high availability. And what that means is that you know, if a host goes down, then the system or the orchestration system is going to move it automatically to somewhere else that's healthy. Um, and so you have no guarantee, really, where a container is running. And then what that in turn translates to is that in config management, you can't write config to like, you know, um, code in terms of very monitoring, saying, oh, like, I want to monitor this server because it runs this container. You know, we have no guarantees towards that. So we need to use some auto-discovery uh, mechanism. 
So just to summarize, you know, everything is dynamic in Docker. That's what makes it stuff a bit harder um, for us as a monitoring solution. And when you're buying a solution like, like the one that we provide at, at Outlier, you expect magic, right? You expect it to just, you know, you do, you do curl if you want to install our agent via curl, or you do Docker run on our, uh, on our agents, um, and you automatically collect metrics, and you want to go to our website, and you'll see metrics, the dashboards, everything firing up. Uh, and you don't really want to customize it, because otherwise you get Prometheus uh, or something like that uh, in the open source world, and customize it to your use case. So what that means for us is that we need to kind of own the integration, right? We need to integrate directly with Docker and not kind of provide a third-party tool like uh, plenty of exist uh, to get the metrics for us, and they, it would forward it to our agent, and we forward it on. We need to actually go directly to Docker. So how do we start, right? So how do we start monitoring a Docker environment? Um, or how do we start monitoring any environment, right? You, I would argue you would uh, start by using off a tool like Top, let's say, you know, some, some UI or some tool that will give you a high-level overview of how, um, of how like, the general, general health of your system. Uh, but how, you know, top, you can use top, of course, on your hosts, and but that will give you everything. So every container that's running on your host, you'll get all the processes and so on. So it doesn't really isolate um, from container to container. But you'll see if there's something like it, right? And you do have that as Docker stats. So if you type literally Docker stats in your command line, you get that on the slides, which is you know, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. You know, it is a stream; it updates every second. Um, so it's kind of like top, really, but but for Docker on the, on on any host. But it doesn't really give you a lot of metrics, as you can see. It's got uh, you know, CPU usage, memory percentage, um, and so on and so forth. And so in my view, it's really useful for kind of like on-demand monitoring when you know that the container is misbehaving and you want to quickly go and check which one it is. But it doesn't really give you anything um, more detailed than that. And for details, we've got the Docker Remote API. So Docker's got an API, an HTTP API, that listens either on the Docker Unix socket or on any kind of listen address that you uh, tell it to. And if you do like a get request slash, slash container, slash container ID, and then stats, you get something like that, um, which is basically, it's a bit out of focus, sorry about that. Uh, it's basically you know, a lot of details in terms of stats, and it's in JSON output, so you can parse that very easily in your um, language of choice. And it also has a cool feature in which that, um, if you want it more than once sequentially, it not only gives you the current data, but also the previous data. So it's basically useful for, you know, if you want to rate, even like you know, CPU percentage, or um, you know, like kilobytes per second on my network interfaces, that's basically what you would use to get, those, uh, to get that data, to get those metrics. Uh, however, as it's part of an API, it has changed with Docker upgrades, and Docker is pretty quick at iterating the um, or iterating the, the product. And we also found that uh, performance wasn't really up to par to what we would expect. It took us about a, up to a couple of seconds per container. So if you've got, let's say, like 20 containers on the hosts, uh, you'd be waiting quite a bit uh, to get all the data for all of your containers in one host. Uh, and now, as kind of a bit of an interlude, you can say, you know, like Alex, you know, why don't we just see what Top does and we use that, right? So we or we extend it. And top, basically what it does is it checks proc, right? And proc, if you guys don't know, it's a virtual subsystem, or virtual file system, sorry, in Linux. And it contains pseudo files, so not actually files. And unfortunately, the reason it doesn't really work well is because <clears throat> those files are not really containerized, except for some namespaces, like the bed namespace, so basically per process statistics, or the net namespace, so network statistics. Uh, stuff isn't really containerized, which means that they will always display host data. And as an example, so, for, so that it's clear, so you're asking what I'm talking about, um, I'm basically here, or here on my first command, checking the load average on my hosts. Then on the second command, I'm basically doing you know, the same thing, but on a Docker container. And you guys can see that the load is the same, right? Like there's, number, there's like 19 tasks running, the load is 18 uh, on average for the last minute. Then if I do a PS, say UX, you can see that there's in fact, you know, excluding the PS command, there's only two running processes. So you know, it really, it doesn't work, right? So we can't really rely on proc. So what we can do is we can use in turn what Docker does for resource control, which is C groups, right? And C groups is basically a Linux kernel feature that predates top, and I guess that's the reason why top doesn't really work um, very well in terms of, uh, of this use case. And what it's responsible for as a Linux kernel feature is to work on groups of processes and limit resource usage and check as well and account for that resource usage. And it's used by you know, like Docker, CoreOS, LXC, and SystemD, and a bunch of other software. So the way that you can use it, or the way that it, it works, is that you've got hierarchies, and hierarchies are groups of processes. And in turn, those groups of processes or hierarchies are connected to subsystems. And the subsystem is basically a group of metrics or, uh, you know, like, or anything that you might want to get. So you've got block IO, you've got CPU, CPU account, and memory, and a bunch of others. But these are the main ones that, we, that we're interested in. So how, how, how do we go actually about using C groups? Right? So you can actually cat proc mounts and see kind of like where your subsystems are, where they're mounted uh, in your hierarchies. You can also check like proc and then container PID. So each container in Docker has a PID. So you can see that if you do Docker inspect. And then if you do proc, container pid, and then C group, you pretty much have the same thing. And then if we go inside one of those directories, and if we take CPU as an example, 
Uh, you can see here that I've got some files and some folders as well. And you know, if you select this file here called CPU um, account usage, it, it actually gives me a number. It gives me a metric, right? And if we go into inside one of those hierarchies, let's say like the Docker one, we said it contains the same kind of files, right? So you can see the kind of like how it's structured and then the hierarchy. And those IDs that uh, you can see there on the slides as well are actually container IDs that I had on my system, uh, had on my on my um, laptop running. So again, if you go inside, then we'll see the uh, the same files again, and you can get metrics basically from reading those files. So you know, to recap, you can get CPU, memory, and disk from C groups, and you can get network, of course, as I said, uh, by a proc and NAT uh, because NAT is uh, containerized. But we're still missing one, right? We're missing load average. So what can we do about load average? So that's where NetLink comes into play. So NetLink is basically a library, or actually, uh, should we phrase that, it's a socket family, like the Unix domain sockets, but you, instead of doing you know, AF Unix, you do AF NetLink, and it allows you to get a socket to the kernel, and not only perform requests to the kernel, so you get, basically say, get me this info, and the kernel will reply back to you, but also you can subscribe to events. And that's because it's basically designed for network info. So the protocols that it has is stuff like root, firewall, ARPD, and that's kind of where you see like the paradigms and what it was designed for if you go and check the code in the Linux kernel. Uh, so as I said, it's duplex, so you can subscribe to events, and the kernel will send you messages, and also initiate the message sending. And it's extensible, so you can build your own protocol um, based on what's already existing, and based on some macros. So in terms of protocols, one that we have existing and available to us is task stats, right? So what this gives you is basically per-process statistics, or per-pids. So you can see here on my slide, I'm basically using a Python library called GNLPy, which is uh, the links here at the bottom. And I'm just getting stats for PIDs. Um, and you can see I've got you know, the number of, number of syscalls that the, the PID um, performed, uh, the, involunt the voluntary and involuntary contact switches, and some other uh, more data that you might find useful. And then we've got another one, which is called C group stats, which uh, seems to be built as an extension to task stats. Like if you go to the code, you can see like the structs that the kernel uses, and it's, it builds on top of task stats. And it gives you stats about the number of processes that are running under a given C, uh, C group hierarchy. So we can basically use the number of tasks that are running to get the load, right? Because load is nothing more than just the number of processes in the run queue at any one point in time. And then if you take that at periodic measurements or at periodic inter intervals, and you use exponential decay or some other uh, moving average, then you get like your load average over one minute, five minutes, um, however you want. It actually works quite well for us. Um, it works pretty well. It's much quicker than like Docker exec like PS, and of course you might not even have PS in our uh, in your in, in your containers, which we found in some use cases. Uh, so that's kind of it for like the base metrics, you know, like that you would uh, get. But now, how how do you go about monitoring actually services in Docker, right? So as I said, you have your plugins and you've got your services like databases, and you want to monitor those, right? So we at Alio we provide you with NetJS plugins, uh, some already out of the box, and you can go to the our web UI and you can modify them as much as you want. They're Python scripts, so it should be pretty easy to um, to modify and um, you know, adapt to your to your own use case. And we made a design decision that the same plugin would work just as well on the host as it would on the container. So what that means, of course, is that we need to modify it somehow, right? Because obviously, as I said, if you've got Redis CLI and you just fire it up, then you're outside the host, you're, sorry, you're outside the Redis container, so that's not gonna work. So we can solve it by using some dark magic, um, which is monkey patching in Python. Um, so as I said, basically, as we use Python, we basically use monkey patching to just override the methods uh, at runtime. So you know, as an example, uh, our Redis uh, plugin, which you can see there, part of, uses uh, Redis CLI, as I said, and we just monkey patch the subprocess call to basically see, oh, like if I'm, if I'm running this against the container, then I'm not going to do subprocess. I'm going to do Docker exact with exactly the same arguments. And that's pretty much it. It's um, pretty much what we do in terms of like monkey patching. And again, again I'm going to say it again, it's a design decision. You could just easily have two plugins, one for containers and one for, um, for the host. So then kind of the, the final thing is orchestrators, right? So how do you make it work with uh, orchestration tools? like Kubernetes, Mesosphere, Swarm, uh, which we found are growing as well, as I've said uh, a lot um, in, recent, um, in recent times. Uh, and in a world with orchestration, you care more about the services that you run rather than individual containers. And if you take Kubernetes as an example, you know, you've got your master node, which is basically your API server that you talk to. You've got the, like your, your actual nodes, which are the workers in your cluster, and you've got pods and services and some other abstractions. And each of those tools that I just showed in the previous slide, like Swarm and so on, they have their own abstractions, so it's kind of hard to get, you know, like a very um, kind of a, a solution abstract way to, to get those metrics. But fortunately, what you can do is that you can look at the labels that are applied to containers, right? Because Kubernetes and Swarm, they both apply labels like node and pod and service to your container. So if you do Docker inspect, you get like, oh, like Kubernetes.pod equals that. And you can take that, and that's basically metadata, right? So you can take that, and not only can you 
plot that and then send it off to some middleware worker. But you can also plot it to your metrics. And we use the, that metadata to allow stuff like this. So you can see here that's a, like a very high level overview. And all of your containers are grouped by the Kubernetes container name. Um, so it's basically useful for getting you know, like a high level overview and dynamically you know, knowing how you can uh, see stuff in your, um, on your infrastructure. And that's, uh, that's, that's kind of it uh, in terms of what, what, how you monitor a solution, how you build a monitoring solution. So what's next for us? So clearly the trend is to run you know, Docker, or is to use Docker to run microservices. Uh, and for an ops team, that gets a bit, uh, gets a bit hard, uh, because obviously, as I said, you're also, you might be also uh, getting things up and down all the time. And you, you want something like the host that I, uh, like the view, sorry, the host view I just showed you, uh, which gives a consistent overview of everything. So what we're going to do next is improve the orchestration tool supports, which of course, you know, as Kubernetes is still in development all the time, Swarm, for instance, just added NetHost, uh, I think it was four days ago, the PR got merged. So we're going to uh, keep improving on that, so on our support, and we're going to build tracing, uh, which is a bit of a different approach and something that you, you might need as well uh, for debugging. So I know I didn't go into that much detail as well in the, in the talk, um, but me and Thibault, who's over there, <laughs> are going to write a couple of blog posts in the, in the near future, so I keep an eye out for that on our blog. Yeah, thank you very much. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.